All right, I want you to imagine two young boys. Two young boys, the camera is rolling. They're in front of the camera, the spotlights are on. They're all of a whopping age five and six. And the interviewer asks them two questions, actually three. The first, do you believe in God? Immediate answer, yes. Well, where is he? Heaven. What does he look like? And the younger of the two says, well, he's got a really long beard, and um, um, he's about average height, and he wears a really long white dress. And the older of the two, the six-year-old, leans over and says, be careful what you say. You don't want to embarrass God, and you sure don't want to embarrass yourself, because he's watching. He is watching, isn't he? And so let me ask you, have you said anything this week, done anything, acted out anything this week that would be so pleasing to God that he'd smile? Or have you said, done, thought anything that would be embarrassing because he's watching? Hey, welcome to Wellspring Church. I see lots of guests in the room. I see folks that have been coming a few weeks. I just want to uh, invite you to become part of Wellspring Church. We're going to finish today's series, Summer in the Psalms. I'm so grateful for Cameron and Brian, those who shared the teaching platform in the last six weeks. It's been a wonderful time. It allowed me and my family to go to family camp in cool, uh, Colorado. I got to enjoy some refreshment there. I got to lead a mission trip to the DR. We got there and served, got back safely. None of us drank anything that killed us. We're grateful for that. Thank you for your prayers and great impact. And we're going to continue to go. But I'm grateful for those guys and I'm grateful for your involvement. Hey, next month, I'm going to teach through 2 Thessalonians. I'm going to talk about what it means to be involved in an engaging, healthy church. And I'm going to ask all of us to get deeply involved in Wellspring. God is at work here. We're a growing church, we're a dynamic church. God is using us to accomplish his mission here to make disciples to be engaged in his mission in this local community and around the world, to be part of a unified group of other churches in our community where revival and rumblings of that's happening, spiritual awakening is happening. In this church, lots of people have come to faith over the last few years, and I want to invite you, come get on that mission. And so in the month of August, we're going to walk through what does that look like for you, for any church in the world, and specifically for Wellspring. And I'm going to cast some vision I feel like God has been placing on my heart. And I want to invite you, come be part of a great church. We'll be better if you join. And so I'm with no holds barred. I'm going to ask you, come be part of Wellspring Church. All right, Summer in the Psalms. Turn to Psalm 139. And while we're preparing for Psalm 139, I'm going to start with a couple other questions. Where is God? That's a great question. Today's psalm is going to answer that, and I trust that it will encourage you and it will inspire you. Psalm 139, when we began to read this, I want you to notice how many pronouns are there. I, me, my, mine. Scholars believe it's the most personal psalm of all of them. It's kind of the zenith of all of the psalms. It's kind of, kind of the, one of the grandest reflections of the psalmist's heart. And they believe that David specifically wrote it. Not all of the psalms were written by David. Probably half or more are attributed to him. And so this is a psalm of David. I want you to notice as we read through this, the first 18, 19 verses are praising the Lord. And then the last five or six are a petition, a request before the Lord. We can learn just from the model of this prayer. He spends two-thirds of the time talking about the greatness of God, reflecting upon the greatness of God, being reminded how wonderful and present and powerful the greatness of God is. Then he has some requests that he brings before the Lord. How many of us pray like that? Or how many of us start a prayer, God, I'm in such deep grief, help me now. And we forget to start with, God, I praise who you are. And God, I want to make sure I lift your name up. Lord, position me to receive what you're about to say. So it's a great model from the very beginning to start with praise before we bring our requests to the Lord. He wants us to bring our requests, but he wants us to bring a heart and mind that's prepared for that. I've already said it once today. I hope your heart and mind is prepared to connect with the Lord today. The early church for 1,500 years came to the central place, and every time they would worship, they would sing hymns, speak a word of God, and two things. New believers were baptized, and every single week, communion occurred. We're doing that today. And I don't want you to go through the motions. 
I pray that God's word would so speak to you that in the next 20, 25 minutes you'd say, oh, I want to come to the Lord's table. I want my heart to lay down my burdens before him and I want to just receive what he's promised me, his presence, his promises, the power that I can live and have joy and peace in my life. And so would you prepare today, let me remind you, every week that we worship, we should respond to the Lord. Most of the time that's privately. Doing business with him, reflecting, Lord, what is it you want from me today? Sometimes you're going to stop and pause and pray with someone. And every week we have prayer partners available. Today our elders will be around the communion tables, men and women waiting for you to pray with them. If you'd like someone to lift your name up. We have someone taking the bar exam on Tuesday. We have lifted her name up already. She may stop again. Some of you have students leaving for college. We're one of those families. We're lifting his name up before the Lord. Some of you are teachers. We're lifting all your names up before the Lord. Thank you for taking our kids. Oh, man, you're an answer to prayer. Some of your families are raising new babies and releasing children God's brought into your home back to their birth family and you've fostered them well and there are dear families here that God has used in a powerful way we're lifting their names up you may want to stop so if you go beyond just private reflection to maybe stopping and praying with someone those will be discreet prayers but they're before the good good father and heavenly father and lastly if you of you may need to publicly say I need to make a defining decision some of you need to say it's time for me to be baptized I need to go public, and I need to repent from my way of life and follow in a holiness to God. Some of you need to say, man, it's time for me to declare, I am committed in my marriage. I'm renewing my commitments there. Some people this last week, we had five people get baptized. Four in this room, one in my pool. We're going to talk about that later. I said, man, God has done something in me, and I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of salvation to me, and I want the world to know that. If you need to be public, we're always ready for you to respond to the Lord. The psalmist also asks this question, who am I? I mean, everybody in life has asked that question. It's a question of identity, and if that question goes unanswered, it becomes a crisis of identity. Perhaps you're there today. Perhaps today you're wondering who you are and what's your life and what's your purpose and what you're to be about. The psalmist so declares that. And I would tell you, by the time we read through this, you'll realize he has no crisis. He has absolute confidence. There's a complete transparency because he doesn't care what other people think about him. He is just before the Lord. And he cares about what the Lord thinks about him. And he's able to see what the Lord thinks about him. And that's my greatest prayer for you today. Man, if you knew how much God loves you, what he has for you, you would not have fear. You would not have worry. You would realize you're the apple of God's eye. And God declares that in Psalm 139, and David reveals that so that you and I today, more than 2,000 years later, would say, oh my God, have your way with me. We're going to get to that place at the end of this psalm, and I pray you would echo the psalmist's heart and say, God, have your way with me. Man, I'll tell you, you would be filled, and you would leave this place saying, man, whoo, I want to walk with God more. I love him so much. I want Jesus just to lead everything about me. God, have your way with me. All right, ready? You ready to dive in? Psalm 139. I'm just teasing you a bit, giving you an appetizer. Psalm 139. We're going to do it a bit differently, and I'm going to ask that you stand and read with me the first few verses. I'm going to read the entire psalm throughout the message. This will be the only time you stand, okay? If you're a guest, you might wonder, do I know when to stand? When do I sit? When do I read out loud or when do I not? So I'm going to read, and you follow along, either in your Bible, there'll be words on the screen. You might want to read someone's, maybe they have an electronic Bible. All of those things are okay. We're going to read and stand now in honor of God's Word, inspired Word, and then we'll sit, and I'll continue the message. All right, Psalm 139. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out, my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in, behind and before. You lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge, oh my gosh, it's too wonderful for me. 
too lofty for me to attain. Lord, thank you for the reading of your word. Please be seated. I want you to notice in verse 1, some of you are going to highlight this in your notes. You may even circle this in your Bible. The Hebrew word for search means to dig, to dig. All right, how many hippies in the room? Anybody here? 60s, 70s? How many of you hippie remake? Anybody got a hippie remake going on? Got a psychedelic shirt in the room? Any hippies in the room? We have at least one in the room. Couple, yeah, one in the back. Well, yeah, here we go, Greg right here. Okay, so you can help us out. You understand what this word means. The hippies in the room will say, man, I dig it. Hey, man, you know, or I dig you. Listen to what this word means. It means that they know and understand and connect with something or someone, maybe even love, because they've dug into it. They've dug in and observed and they've watched and they've dug beyond the surface. They've gone deeper. They didn't just stop at the outside. You know, when you get past the veneer, which is just a fake thing on top of kind of particle board furniture, when you get past all that, you you find out what something really is or who someone really is. You can't know that until you dig a bit. That's why people do background searches. Anybody had to have a background search lately? Okay, Maybe you applied for a job. You're a teacher. Every teacher in the world has to have that. Maybe you have uh, needed clearance at our Air Force Base. The reason we do background searches is because they want to make sure that you could be trusted at that moment or in the future. Several years ago, my cousin was doing an entry into the Secret Service and the FBI. He's been serving many years doing that. But they called me out of the blue. I mean, this is 20, 30 years ago. They asked questions about every shenanigan we did when we were 12, 15, and 18 years old. Because if he's ever going to stand next to the President of the United States, they want to know every detail of his life. They were digging. I mean, dig, dig, dig. Dating couples. Got any dating couples in the room that might get married? I know there's a few here. I'm looking at some families. I'm involved in their young adults' lives. They're going to get married here in a couple of months. Let me tell you, it's important if you're dating to the point where you are thinking about marrying that other person for you to dig a lot before you say, I did. And all the married couples in the room said, amen. All right, so listen up. Here's something I suggest that everybody do, because if you can't get an FBI background check, and you probably can't, here's something that you ought to do. The man and the woman ought to show up for a morning date, pre-coffee, so you're not very alert, and neither of you looks like a million bucks. You haven't shaved, you haven't taken a shower. The woman needs to come with absolutely no makeup, no eyeshadow, no eyebrows, and all the women. <gasps> and you need to look at each other. And then you need to have work glo- gloves on, work clothes on, and the two of you need to go and serve someone else together. And then you need to watch each other. You need to watch and go, man, how do they respect authority? Do they honor everyone? Is there equality in the way they treat people? Gosh, are they a respecter of the wealthy and the poor? How do they interact with one another? And when they get tired, do they push through? Do they have endurance? Do they get cranky? Do they complain? There's gripers. There's complainers. There's doers. What category are they they in? When you watch them on that kind of a morning date, and if you decide, I've been digging a lot, and with eyes wide open, the more I dig, the more I love, then, man, you ought to stand in front of the church and God and everybody else and say, till death do us part, I do, yes, better for worse, richer for poorer, all the above. And as soon as you get married, man, you need to shut your eyes and forget all the flaws they've got. You need to dig in the relationships in life. Here's a cool marriage stat, a little marriage moment today. The number one factor of couples that have stayed together for a lifetime, my wife and I, 29 years. Many in this room, 30, 40 years. Here's the number one stat. Couples who have served together outside of themselves stay married. If you want a 100% guarantee that our marriage is going to work, go serve before you ever get married. Serve others outside of yourself, not just take, take, take. And realize, man, the person I'm about to marry, they know how to serve. And if I serve them and they serve me, man, we got a good thing going on right here. And it says that 100% of couples that do that stay married. So if you want some good marriage advice, ask for a Saturday morning uh, little ugly date and see how it goes. If it goes well, you might be good marriage uh, material. Psalm 139, the most personal psalm of all, says this. 
God is all-knowing and God digs you. How groovy is that, huh? God digs you. He knows everything about you. He loves you. And the more he knows about you, the more he loves you. And I just want to tell you, I hope that fills your soul. Look what the psalmist said in verse 6. The psalmist said, oh, to consider all that, that knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too lofty for me to attain. It's incomprehensible. It's unfathomable. Words cannot describe when I think about how much God loves me. I want you to notice this next portion. Not only is God all-knowing, God is all-present. All right, theologians in the room, we're going to give you three words. We use these in theology all the time. You can write them down. They'll be on the screen. Three big attributes of God. Omniscient, which means he's all-knowing. Omnipotent, he's all-powerful. Omnipresent, he's always present. One of my favorite pastors, he's speaking to my soul for over 30 years, Tony Evans, he's a pastor, author in the Dallas area. He comments about these three attributes of God and how they work together. Listen to this. God knows what needs to be done. God knows what needs to be done. That's omniscient. He, he knows. God has the power to do it. That's omnipotence. And then God always, he's always wherever he needs to be to do whatever needs to be done. That's omnipresent. Now think about that. Omnipresence. It's kind of hard for us to wrap our brains around, isn't it? Because we can only be at one place at one time. Or our kids expect us to be three places at one time. Okay? Our workplace sometimes expects us to be two places at one time. But only God can do that. That's beyond kind of super marvel sort of stuff. He is present in all places all the time. There's not one thing in the world that compares to that. So when you ask a five and six year old boy, where is God? They move pretty quickly from he's in heaven to he's everywhere. And that's the simple truth. The psalmist declares this present, this truth. God is present in all places. Verse seven, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, you want to know what that means? For those of you who are beachgoers, how many of you have gotten a chance to cool off San Diego, L.A., been near the beach? At the end of the day, you're kind of looking for that green flash in the water, whatever that is. Maybe in the morning when the sun rises up. Scholars believe when he talks about this, if I rise on the wings of the dawn, if you can imagine the wings of God as soon as the sun begins to come up, going all the way across the world to the horizon, that's what he's talking about. It's when the instant of the sun comes up and the wings of the Lord are covering all of the earth. Even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. One of the top ten fears of all humanity is to be in the dark. Summertime used to be filled with those moments. If you grew up in a place where there were fireflies, you just got to run around in the dark, and you were hoping to catch one, capture one, all the above, play games in the dark, hide and seek, kick the can, all the above. You used to be able to do all that. Kids, that was a land far, far away. We don't get to do that much. But one of the things you did not want was to have to go in the dark someplace that you were unaware of what it might be. And you wanted somebody to hold your hand to show you to have a flashlight so that you wouldn't step. I love what it says in verse 12. Even the darkness will not be dark to you. Do you find yourself in a dark place today? Some of you do. Do you need to ask God to light the way? God, I need to see what I can't see right now. That's a good, honest prayer. And the Lord's going to remind you, it's not dark to me, and I do want to light your way. How many of you have a decision this week, and you need to know, Lord, I'm not sure what to do. Ask God to light your path, and he will do that. He will guide you. He loves you. There is no place that God is not present. God's present everywhere. 
There is no place that God is not present. I hope you know that. I love the way Paul describes it. It's a great encouragement. In Romans 8, reminder that nothing separates us from the love of God. I'm convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love and presence of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God is present in all places and at all times. Look at this next part, verse 13. And I would say that mothers probably understand this deeper than those who have not ever carried a child in the womb. It's a fascinating, powerful verse. You created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully, wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know them full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. As God began life in the womb, God knows every single life that he's created, and he alone should lead that life. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. And when I awake, I am still with you. All the days of my life were written in your book. When I was born, all the days of my life were written in your book. Lord, before I was born, when I was in my mother's womb, God was present. When I was going through adolescence and trying to figure out how I was growing and all the questions of life, God was present. When I was a young husband 29 years ago, God was present. When I was a new father, a rookie father, I made all the rookie mistakes. I'm a good dad today because I've made every mistake possible. You got practice with seven kids, hey, you got a lot of mistakes. God was present in all those. When I lived well and I, when I walked near the steps of hell, God was present. And when I approach death and ultimately go home, and that day will come. You live in the U.S., you're going to pay taxes. You live on the earth, you're going to die someday. Two guarantees in life. God's going to be present. There's no coincidences. There's no happenstance. When God inspired these words to be written, the psalmist is just saying, man, everything about me, God is orchestrating. Man, all these relationships he's putting together. How in the world would that person born over there and 13 years later I would connect with them here and God, you had that as part of the purpose of my life. So many times people think, man, this is a small world we live in. The longer you live, the smaller it gets. It's amazing how all the pieces start coming together. Now I've got some good questions for us today and so I'm going to help us just struggle a bit. The thinkers in the room, I want you to engage right here. Some of you contrarians are already thinking, so if God is in charge of all this, and he's all-knowing and all-powerful, and he's all-present, and all the days of my life are written, am I just a robot, and I am an automaton, am I a puppet? Because that's the kind of the way this looks. Those are good questions, hard questions. And so let me help us think through a little bit regarding the power and sovereignty and the provident hand of God with... His creating mankind with choices and the ability to reason and the ability to act and all of those things. You may have asked this question lately. If God is present, why is there war on the earth? If God's present, why do the people I love die? If God is present, why do bad things happen to me? If God is present, why do I hurt? If God is present, why is there evil? Those are good questions, aren't they? I hope you ask those questions, and I hope you go to God with those questions. He is not afraid of those questions. So what the psalmist constantly would go to him, and the psalmist would find relief. He would find reason. He would find rest for his soul because God would speak to him. I often quote what Dr. Jim Dennison out of Dallas says. He says this, God is graciously at work to redeem all that he sovereignly allows. God is on the throne and sovereign. I believe that. God is loving and gracious and faithful and true and just and merciful. I believe that. 
Romans 8, 28. He's at work to use all things for his glory and to mold us to the image of Christ to make us more Christ-like and useful for his glory. I believe that. I do not have all the answers of why evil and why bad things happen to you and me and why some choices seem to be irresponsible and yet they're allowed to be happening. I don't have answers for all of those things. We live in a fallen, broken world and I know that all of us reap the consequence of sin and brokenness. That's very clear. But here's what I've decided to do. I find great comfort and reassurance when I simply rest that the Lord is present wherever I am. In all the circumstances that I'm going through life, He is there and His character has not changed. And I pray that you would find that as well. We sang earlier about the deep love of God and the rest and peace that he wants to give us. And I pray that you would experience that. God is present at all times and all places. Look what he says here in verse 19. Even when surrounded by evil. If only you, God, would slay the wicked. Away from me, you who are bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. I love what he says here. Away from me, you who are bloodthirsty. Hey, when's the last time you said that in a public uh, statement? Huh? My wife, you guys know her. She'll say this all the time. In the name of Jesus. I mean, she'll rebuke things immediately. I've told you many times, if I say Jesus three times, you better watch out. Because I'm either really frustrated asking the Lord to help me. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I'm driving down the road and I need an adjustment, the Lord will adjust me. Or I'm facing something and I begin to say, man, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I call upon the name of Jesus. He is saying right here, man, there's a spiritual battle and the evil around me. Man, I'm going to rebuke that. Because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. God's power is greater. And so many of us, I want to teach you, many of us are just going through life frustrated, trying to do things on our own. We forget we need to say in the power of God, get away from me. All the evil, get away from me. You have no place in this household. I'm not going to let you claim my kids. I'm not going to let you take my church. I'm not going to let you take my business. Get away. Lord, you cast out this evil, and the Lord will do that. And we need to have the confidence that the psalmist has. And in the name of Jesus, say, get back. You evil people, beings, thoughts that are bloodthirsty or trying to kill, steal, and destroy my life. Jesus came to give me life and give it abundantly. I'm claiming in Jesus' name. I love the last part of this psalm. It points this out. God is worthy of our thoughts and our openness. Psalmist is about to open his soul. He's about to just crack open his chest and say, God, have your way. Look at these words in verse 23, 24. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Hey, notice the verses before this. David admits in front, if it was up to me, I would kill my enemies. That's what he says in those previous verses. If it was up to me, not only would I cast them out, I would take them life in my own hands. So, Lord, remove the evil from me and, Lord... Search me, change me. Oh, God, lead me. I need you to lead me because if I lead myself, I'm going to get into a mess. Lord, you lead me. Roger Ellsworth in his book, Opening Up the Psalms, says it this way. This is the way of righteousness. It and it alone finally leads to everlasting life. The child of God has received the imputed righteousness of Christ. If we read out of 2 Corinthians 5, Verse 17 through 21. If any man's in Christ, he's a new creation. All the old is past and the new has come. Verse 17. Verse 21. God made him who knew no sin, Christ, to become sin on our behalf so that we might have the righteousness of God. God's righteousness has been given to us in exchange for our sin. That's what brings salvation. It's a deep theological truth and a simple thing to understand. When that righteousness is given to us, we can live out of gratitude and seek to live a righteous life. Do you seek to live a righteous life? 
mean, if you just came to church today so you could get your clothes, hair made up, whatever, that's not a very good reason. But if you seek to know the Lord and follow Him, that's a great reason. And the Lord says, man, seek me today and let me lead your life. And so I want us to read these two verses together. We're going to listen to a testimony. And then I'm going to ask you to respond to the Lord today when you take communion. Would you read verse 23 and 24? It should be on our screen. It should be in your notes right there. I'm using the New International. I want you to read this verse with me. Everyone read together. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting.